My name is Monk Rowe, and we're in Toronto filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive at the IAJ convention. I'm very pleased to have journalist Howard Mando with me Thank here you. today. It's a pleasure to meet you, and I've been reading you for a number of years. So, thanks for coming. Nice to be here. You know, I, I, you and I are actually um, very close in age, and I think back when I was starting to listen to records, and for some reason I was hearing like Little Eve in the Locomotion. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering why you got into jazz at apparently an early age. Uh, well, I was listening to Ramsey Lewis in the in crowd uh -huh. and uh, rhythm and blues music. Um, it was on the local radio. Uh, I grew up in Chicago and uh, I lived in a community that was, uh, I was on the south side of Chicago, so it was a neighborhood that was divided uh, by Stony Island Avenue, which is a large commercial. Uh, street, and on one side was the black neighborhood, on the other side was the white neighborhood, but we went to the same grammar schools. And I, I just didn't understand what the distinction was, you know, why there was this kind of divide in the community. Um, and so I was curious about uh, my black neighbors and playmates, schoolmates, and I liked the music from an early age. I mean, my parents had a few uh, jazz records, nothing, nothing, they were not heavy listeners. Uh, mostly listen to show tunes, but I liked, uh, and they had f some some classical music, and I liked the Russians. I liked the drama, uh, Rimsky Korsakov, mm -hmm. you know, anything with r the rhythm and you know the exotic colorations, and I heard that in some of the jazz music that I was exposed to also, and so um, I just gravitated to it very naturally. It just seemed like, uh, yes, I like instrumental music. I like this kind of rhythm and blues feel with the backbeat. Mm -hmm. um, I liked it more than uh, the country and western sort of influence that was coming in from Elvis and that level of rock and roll. And uh, I liked the complexity. I was also an inter intellectual snob at an early age. And I thought that the, um, uh, the music that I was really interested in early, Miles Davis, some early Coltrane, uh, Eric Dolphy around 1963, 64. It just seemed to me akin to the movies that I was watching. I was exposed to some early Truffaut and Godard, that sort of thing. And I saw those kinds of connections. So I didn't really see it as like swing or, um, or bebop. I just knew it as dramatic, fractured, mm -hmm. uh, abstracted, fast, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. I understand you took some piano. I had some piano lessons. Yeah. When I was in high school, I took some uh, saxophone, uh, flute lessons. I still play flutes and a little bit of saxophone. In college, I took some synthesizer courses and stuff like yeah. that. Uh, you mentioned being in, uh, considered yourself an intellectual. Do you think it's... An intellectual snob. An intellectual <laughs> snob. <laughs> I couldn't claim to be an intellectual. <laughs> okay. Do you think that, that people, the general listening audience, connects being intellectual snobs with jazz. Yeah, I'm afraid they do. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's this mythology that you have to know everything about jazz, or jazz is some sort of heady music that, you know, is not accessible readily. I, I've never understood that exactly. I mean, it's just it's so dramatic. I can understand it. When I, I would go to hear music by some of the aging, really the swing masters. Um, Jimmy Forrest, Eddie Lockjaw Davis, mm -hmm. guys like this. Now they were mm, a little bit past their prime, I suppose, by the time that I was hearing them in the late 60s. And um, they did not represent what I considered the avant-garde. They were not taking structural chances. They were not playing the extremes of their horn. I didn't hear the vocalization in that that I'd heard in the art ensemble. And again, this was th some, I should backtrack a little bit. It was a matter of circumstance that I grew up near University of Chicago, where a lot of the AACM uh, experimentation was being done. Mm -hmm. So I, it was some place that I could go of an evening. Uh, my parents let me out with the car, and we had moved to the northern suburbs. I didn't have any friends there. My friends were still on the south side. So some place that I could meet or go to be near um, my previous home was the University of Chicago concert. So I heard Roscoe Mitchell and Lester Bowie and. Muhal Richard Abrams. But then at the same time, I thought, well, that's jazz, and then here's this other jazz going on. 
uh, uh, Joe Siegel would uh, put on Sunday afternoon concerts of these older swing tenor players, swing to bop tenor players. And I didn't understand it. It didn't attract me. It was a lot of notes. A lo you know, the constant stream of eight notes, sixteenth notes. I didn't hear the melodies being played. I didn't hear them pausing. It seemed to me that the songs were all very similar. The solos did not partake of the melody. They partook of the changes I've learned later. But it just felt like they were running changes. And to me, that is inaccessible to the general audience. They do not understand why, why that's interesting. The notes seem even and consistent, um, but they're not making melodies. They're just making a lot of notes. And, and the interaction there, although I think the jazz people understand it very well, the kind of interaction that's going on, I think to the listener who's not exposed uh, in a deep way, it sounds pro forma. And you do not hear the interaction between the, the drummer and, and the, uh, the saxophonist and the, the pianist who's comping uh, for the soloist. It, it, you, don't, you don't hear it as something that's being created afresh. Now again, maybe it's because these guys were a little bit past their prime. They didn't have the fire. I don't know if, I, I know what you're saying because a lot of people say I like jazz until they stop playing the melody, mm -hmm. you know, and then they, they get in a sense lost mm -hmm. because they don't know the form or, or they don't hear the tune anymore. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't you say that some of the older listeners would say some of those same comments about the AACM? Well, people? yes, but I, I was interested in the narrative that the AACM was willing to, or was, in, was interested in developing. And the fact that it was a fragmentary, or, or fragmented, or a, um, I was able to follow that more easily. I mean, it seemed to have changes in it. It, it had more change because it was fractured or fragmented as opposed to being bop, 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 bop for 10 minutes or 12 minutes or 15 minutes, which didn't seem to have any change to me. But you're not talking about chord changes. You're, no, you're I'm talking about, about actual like emotional structural changes, changes yeah. emotional. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the vividness and the drama, again, is really what I was, I think, yeah. caught up with originally. Right. And the sort of maturity and the subtlety of um, a Lockjaw Davis or a Jimmy Forrest was a little bit lost on me because I didn't have any connection to the to the, the source material that they were taking mm -hmm. off from. I mean, I heard that as, you know, American standards and corny, not necessarily corny. I liked him when Fred Astaire sang him, or, <laughs> you know, but I didn't feel like this is a vehicle for spilling out great new melodies. Now, when Miles played them uh, in the uh, quintet music of the mid 50s, which also I was exposed to as an early teenager, I liked that very much. But he, Miles is somebody who um, taps into the drama of a song and uses silence. He's not playing a steady stream of eighth notes, you know, or sixteenth notes. And he, the way he phrased and the vocal inflections, mm -hmm. all that stuff, I really connected with. I love that. Yeah. You've mentioned uh, the vocal connection, people, instrumentalist using vocal. Uh, Lost for words here. Well, Sound inflections, like, nuance. Vocal inflections, it seems very important to you. I was a way of connecting. I was not um, also taken with vocal, with pop vocal music. Um, it just didn't. Again, I like the rhythm and blues sound. I, I don't know why. The hoarseness, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, of some of the male uh, or, the, or the masculine baritone singers. You know, I, I remember Duke of Earl very well, or um, Ali Oop, yeah, the Coasters. Sure. <laughs> and these are the kinds of songs that I like. But I was not into the ballads. I didn't care about Johnny Mathis, you know, that was hot at the time. I don't think I had been exposed to Jackie Wilson then. Um, one of the first jazz vocals that I really remember, was, and this was again on my parents' records, um, was Doris Day singing Sentimental Journey with Les Brown. Mm -hmm. And I, I really liked that. And it was on a, a sampler, Lucky Strikes put out some sort of, you know, this is jazz yeah. LP. Yeah. And it also had uh, Count Basie's One O'Clock Jump on it, which mm -hmm. I liked a lot. And th that which sort of mystified me because it didn't have a melody at the beginning. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and so that gave me a sense that there was a way of arriving at something in a different structure that I, 
I mean, uh, I, that's okay. All right, yeah. you know, I can buy that then. But um, I, know, I think this is more of my intellectual snobbery that rock and roll and pop music just didn't seem, um, I don't know, uh, sophisticated enough or interesting. And the singing, especially uh, you know, 12, 13 is when, when I was 12 and 13 is when the Beatles came on the scene. Yeah. And they were singing, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, no, <laughs> no, no, no. You know, it's just too dumb. You know, I, I'm more sophisticated than that. You know, I read Hemingway or something. And you must have been an avid reader. Yeah, I was an yeah. avid reader. And uh, that's really what led me into anything that I could, you know, pretend to be intellectual pursuits. Uh -huh. um, books and movies. Yeah. Did your parents find it interesting that the jazz music was interesting to you? Uh, they weren't put off by it particularly. Um, I don't. I don't. They like. They they encouraged my aesthetic pursuits and my brothers. You know, it was fine to have mm -hmm. piano lessons at home. My dad, I think, had had piano lessons when he was a kid, although he'd never pursued it very mm -hmm. far. So they bought a piano. Presumably, he was going to spend some time playing. I don't think he did. He was on the road. He was a traveling salesman, so mm -hmm. he was away a lot. But. Um, he would come in and play a few show tunes or something like that from very, very simple sheet music. And I was lucky that I uh, eventually got with a piano teacher who showed me how to make chords and, mm -hmm. and um, read a cheat sheet, you know, basically, yeah. Yeah. instead of just reading classical music or something like mm -hmm. that. So. What inspired uh, you to pursue a career as a writer? Well, again, I have to give my dad a lot of appreciation for encouraging that. Um, at one point, a conversation I remember well, he and I were driving and he said, have you thought about what you want to do when you grow up? I was maybe 12 or 13. And I said, oh, I don't know. And he said, well, when I was your age, I wanted to be a writer. And I get, I thought, that's okay? That would be okay? You know? <laughs> so uh, I, he said to me at the time, you know, the, the people who you're reading, though, most of them were reporters first. And many of them were sports writers. I was reading Damon Runyon and Ring Lardner, and uh, also P.G. Wodehouse, who I don't think was a sports writer. But um, I had no very little interest in sports. I was a Cubs fan, and that always seemed to me more like the Marx Brothers <laughs> than like a professional sports team. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'm not too interested in sports. But I could write about the movies. I could write about books. And I wrote about culture. Uh, I had a little newspaper when I was in I don't know, sixth grade where we, I wrote movie reviews for my own little newspaper that I was putting out. I was on the high school uh, newspaper. Right. And when we moved to the suburbs, that was pretty good, actually, journalistic training. Uh, it was a weekly paper, and it was substantial for a high school paper. And when I was in college also, I was the culture counterculture editor of a college paper for a while mm -hmm. in Syracuse University. And uh, of course, there was a big explosion of, of music in the uh, in the late '60s, and I did connect with pop music at that time: Jimi Hendrix, uh, Aretha Franklin, uh, Motown, and some rock and roll, Surrealistic Pillow, The Jefferson Airplane. I liked anything that was out, you know, anything that seemed psychological or seemed surreal mm -hmm. was of interest to me. So. Um, some of the San Francisco bands, uh, like Quicksilver Messenger Service, I remember I liked a lot. And uh, the blues stuff from Chicago, um, uh, even on the white side, Mike Bloomfield and uh, uh, Paul Butterfield. Um, so that, that interested me, and uh, more so than the British invasion. And of course, be, you know, it became possible to, to, to write about music. It seemed like especially the ACM music that I was hearing, I didn't see many people in the audience who would be in a position to write about it. I wasn't reading much about it. Uh, Terry Martin, John Litweiler, and J.B. Figgy, the guys who were writing the liner notes for the Delmark records that were coming out, were the only people who seemed to be acknowledging this music, which I, I just found fascinating. And I thought, I could write something about this. I could, if I just really concentrate on what I can be sure I know, and transmit just that, and try not to speculate, and try not to put critical judgments on it that are, 
I, I just want, I want to, it, it was subject matter to me that I could express um, verbally, you know, on the page. And it seemed like very dramatic. And of course, you know, when you're young, if you want to be a writer, you really don't have much to write about. You can write about yourself and, you know, your teenage angst or something. And I was, I shunned that idea. And then I didn't have anything else to write about. So mm -hmm. here was something that was not me, but I was interested in mm -hmm. and seemed so inherently dramatic. And um, the challenge of writing about sound, we can't see it, you can't touch it. So how do you describe it to somebody else in a way that's going to convey the, the sense of it? And that became, uh, a, it was a challenge and I was interested in it and I began to, uh, to focus on it. And I had a little bit of success in placing some articles. Um, and I think it just was because I pursued listening to it so avidly. Mm -hmm. I went to the Ann Arbor Blues and Jazz Festivals. I worked at the Jazz Record Mart in Chicago, so I met several musicians. Um, Basically getting to know the whole scene as much as you can. I mean, you said an important thing there, to write only what you know or feel strongly about. Well, I felt there was so much that I didn't know anything about, I mean, especially when I was 18 to 25 or something. I mean, uh, it was just scratching the surface. I had no idea mm -hmm. what this world was that the music was coming out of. Mm -hmm. And I, I was interested, but I wanted to be very respectful. I was a little shy, as outsiders are. Um, I felt like it was okay to ask questions. That's the journalistic training I had. You know, you ask a question, find out, you know. You're asking out of curiosity. It's, it's genuine and it's not uh, displaying uh, some sort of awkward eagerness, or even if it is, so what? You know, nobody's gonna find that out on the page. Mm -hmm. You know, you, whatever the experience is when you do the interview, that's not what you transmit to the page. <laughs> you transmit the page what you learned after the interview, what you know, what you've come out of it with. Mm -hmm. And um, I had ambitions to write fiction, so I felt like it was perfectly okay to change the experience for the, not to change the information, but to change the, the narrator's uh, stance. When I got to the page, I didn't have to seem like I was 20 years old. I could seem like I was 25 or 30. I see. Uh, you know, and in fact, when, I mean, she may have been just flattering me, but once I met Marian McPartland at a gig and uh, introduced myself, and she said, oh, I've been reading you for several years. I thought you were much older. And, you know, again, I, I wanted to be in Downbeat at that time, and uh, I started writing for Downbeat in 74. And I didn't want to seem like the kid on the block. I wanted to write in a way that seemed like comparable, comparably mature to some of the older critics, to Leonard Fett. I didn't want to seem any less mature or knowledgeable than Leonard, whatever I was writing about. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to come in with a gee whiz attitude, you know? <laughs> um, so I thought that that was okay to take that, that liberty as a writer. Yeah. Is it harder to make a living as a jazz writer than it is as a jazz musician? Well, I've never been a jazz musician. I think that yeah. it's a pretty hard road to go to. Being friends with musicians, not just in jazz, but contemporary com composed music mm -hmm. or chamber music. This is not an easy way to make a living. I, I do not find it easy to make a living as a jazz writer. No, I don't. Um, I've been doing it for 26, 27 years now. It hasn't gotten any easier. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, in the last couple of years especially, there's been a great uh, sad drain of outlets. For a while, um, when the dot-com world was new and uh, burgeoning, there was a lot of work that could be done in the web. Um, good outlets. Uh, there were magazines that sprung up and now have disappeared. Uh, most recently, Tower Pulse, uh, Sound, what was it Sound Aspects? The that Dan Willett was editing for a couple years had been a good outlet. Now it's gone. Uh, music and Sound Output was another one that was I was active with in the '80s. Um, there's been a there's been a um, retraction of publications. It has to do with our general economy in the U.S. It has to do with raising postage rates. It has to do with uh, competition from the web and television and movies. Uh, I think with the hegemony of major companies that are 
pumping out a lot of hype around big pop stars and less interest in smaller uh, niche audiences. Um, um, you know, there are a lot of cultural reasons for it. Yeah. Uh, right now, there's a big retraction in uh, uh, liner notes. And I've always enjoyed writing liner notes because when you do a liner note, you really are being exposed to the music for the, you're one of the first people who gets exposed to it. And you kind of guide the listener who's going to buy this album into how to appreciate it, what went behind it. And if you write a good liner note, I think it, it stays with the record for the life of the record. So I've liked it's doing that. But w when they went from LPs to CDs, they turned the liner note from being a uh, point of purchase uh, uh, stimulus. You know, when I would go through yeah. record stores, I'd look at the liner note reader Absolutely. standing there and decide whether I wanted to buy the thing or not. Well, now they're on the inside of the jacket. You don't see them until after you've written, bought the CD. So I was afraid for a long time that the record companies would catch on, that this was no longer a valuable service that yeah. the writers were uh, providing. But now they just don't run liner notes because it's another couple hundred dollars to the production yeah. budget and they can't afford it. Oh, that's unfortunate, and it's so true. Because uh, I did the same thing. You know, you you obviously can't hear the record when you're holding it, but you can read about it, and that's where I got a lot of my information because there wasn't all the publications out back then. And it's a it's a real art to write a good liner notes. It was too. an art, and I think it really influenced my writing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a nice thing. I mean, the liner notes were not kind of on, ro on rock records. Very seldom, excuse me, any liner notes. If they were, they were very jivey and, yeah. you know, hyped up. But on a, a jazz record, when you're reading Ira Gittler or Dan Morgenstern or Nat Hentoff, you learn something about how the music was put together and who these people were. And it really helped me to, to figure out what jazz writing was about. Mm -hmm. More than um, the classic uh, books that were available in the 60s, uh, Hodier or uh, Panacea, and this did not strike me as being true of the jazz experience as I knew it, what they were right. writing. They Marshall, were writing his history. The histories, right. and you know, they were really from the 30s, then they were French, and they had a completely different frame of context, and it didn't seem anything like what Chicago was in the 50s and 60s <laughs> to me. <laughs> I'm sure it yeah. wasn't. <laughs> but Hentoff and Morgenstern and Gittler, a few other people, yeah. you know, touched on something that I could recognize. Right. When you w we're in this environment here at this uh, jazz convention, it's probably unrealistic. It it seems that the music is so healthy mm. in this environment. Mm -hmm. What's your realistic view of where it's at? I think the music is very healthy. I think the industry is rather sick. I think we're in a ch time of great change as to how to disseminate this music and figuring out what, what function it serves. What's the social utility of, of jazz today? But I think that there are Realistically, I do think that there is jazz permeates American culture and has made significant uh, inroads into culture basically all around the world. Um, I think it's a very uh, dynamic art form. I think it's a very adaptive art form. I think it's got a lot of uh, strategies and techniques, tactics that can be applied to many, that, that, that many people who want to express themselves can apply their own um, uh, cultural material and their own internal feelings through the forms that jazz offers. And I think that that's been widely recognized. And I think that uh, in Europe or in Asia or Australia or South America, you know, we're hearing musics that are could only have been created after exposure to jazz. Mm. Uh, and I think in America, Yes, this festival gives us a somewhat, or this convention gives us a somewhat skewered view. Here are all these people running around. But I mean, I recognize you come to Toronto in January in the kind of recession that we're experiencing economically. This is the hardcore of the jazz proponents here. They do represent a larger uh, general market, overall market. Um, but I go to, whenever I travel, I hear jazz on the radio, I see it on TV. You may don't see it like a featured, here's an hour of a jazz artist, but you hear it in commercials, mm -hmm. you hear it in background music. You know, it's the music, it's the music of our time and of our country. Uh, and I really think that it's, 
impossible to ignore. It's a little bit like air. We just breathe it and we don't necessarily think about it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, um, w was reading something from a, an earlier interview when you were talking about country music, how it has such marketing power behind it. And um, you mentioned a number of times the business aspect of jazz. Is there a way to make jazz uh, close to being as popular as country music? I don't. Th I, I I hope not. I mean, not that I would not like to see jazz be popular, but I don't think making jazz mm. do anything is good for the art. It's a great, great thought. I think. You know, I mean, I really trust jazz so much. It is, despite um, the challenges that the musicians have faced for a hundred years now, they have been able to really devote themselves to creating some incredible art that nobody could have made. No, nobody except the artists themselves could have made it. No record executive could have told Louis Armstrong to go in and record the Hot Fives, you know? Mm -hmm. They just couldn't have imagined it. And I think that it's a lot easier for a record executive, a producer, to say to a a country artist who's working off a ballad tradition, you know, a storytelling narrative, why don't you turn your attention to this subject matter? Mm -hmm. um, when we speed it up a little bit and put this kind of rhythm under it, okay, we're talking about a formulaic right. sort of yeah. uh, product, and, and when record executives talk about jazz as product, I just kind of cringe. This, that's not the way the good music has, has come about. Whether we're talking about Ascension or Kind of Blue or Love Supreme, or prime time, or Nat Coleman stuff, or Cecil Taylor stuff. This is not music that can be. We're going to make this popular now by doing this to it. No, this is like this is an art form. If you've got the expression as an artist, and you can realize that expression, you've done something that people are going to listen to for. I, I think hundreds of years. That's my thought about it. And if it connects to an audience immediately, great, great. Um, it should. It would be great if it could. Mm -hmm. But. There, there's so much between what the average listener, the common American, uh, is is ready to uh, accept as music, and what the very sophisticated and very um, creative uh, artist in sound is able to realize. There's so much gap between that that I, I really don't see that it's going to connect in yeah. an easy way. Well, with face paint or, we, you know, with an advertising campaign. I mean, it wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt to de demystify some of the stuff that, that goes into jazz. It would help. And I think um, jazz education is doing a good job of that. Uh, not just the IHAE conferences, but um, Newport, when I go to, uh, to Rhode Island for the festival in August, or Chicago, where they have a free festival around Labor Day, you get 10,000 people out. Those people are not all devoted jazz fans, but they get hooked in, mm -hmm. sometimes to some very strong, unusual music, you know. Um, or I, I don't think that it's a music that you've got to be a PhD to enjoy. I do think that there's a lot of uh, I don't know, sort of nonsense about what's good in music that kids, like I've got a 10-year-old daughter, that she gets exposed to on a regular basis from commercial yeah. um, media. And to overcome that and to realize that there's other stuff too that's just not getting the commercial hype, that's not a thought that uh, comes uh, readily to, uh, to a lot of people. Right. Um, recently, I've had a couple conversations with Musicians, uh, white fellas in their, let's say, between 35 and 50. And they've made the comment that that's not a good thing to be <laughs> in the jazz world these days. You know, middle-aged white. Mm. Does, that, does that comment uh, Well, I think, that, you know, a lot of us feel like as a middle-aged white guy, you know, it, it, it's work to keep up with the changes in our in our world, but I don't think that it's a bad thing to be trying to do that. Um, 
Are they saying that they don't get respect from the musicians? I or are you talking about musicians themselves? Who the musicians themselves. And they feel like, I don't know, to me that sounds like an excuse. Mm. Um, this is a music that comes out of an African-American uh, basis. I've thought of it as the African-American gift to the world. And there have always been very strong white musicians. Back to Adrian Rollini, up to Steve Lacey, Tim Byrne, uh, Dave Douglas, Myra Melford, who I was hanging out with last night, or uh, you know, Marilyn Crispell, Maria Schneider, um, or middle-aged white guys. I mean, um, there are a lot of players who are quite strong. Uh, Marty Ehrlich, somebody who I enjoy quite a lot. You have to you have to do something with the music. You can't just uh, learn it and play it and expect people to, or, or, or let's see, e expect to say something significant. I think that any artist, and maybe people who are 35 to 50 are coming to grips with this in a really mature way, you have to say something that's of some significance and you have to delve into yourself to find out what that is that you have to say. And it's not just like the energy of the 25-year-old, you know. I've mm -hmm. got the chops, I've got the, the breath, and now I'm going to play for an hour. It's like, well, now what's, what's important to say? What do we have to say that's lasting? And I think that that's a challenge that comes to any artist in any art form, you know, in middle age. So I think that they come to grips with the challenges. What does it mean to be white in America, playing a music that comes from an African-American basis? What does it mean to be middle-aged and to be devoted to an art form that seems to be giving back very little in the way of monetary uh, support. You know, what distinguishes my work from his work, whether he's black, white, purple, Latin, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that those are, you know, difficult challenges that we have to face, but I think it's, I think it's a, uh, an excuse to say, well, I'm white and I'm middle-aged so nobody cares about me. Uh -huh. Well, then make me care about you. you know, okay. Tell me your story. Tell me what's really, you know, because I'm white and middle-aged, so I would be interested in hearing what you have to say. You know? uh -huh. We're still the baby boomers, the white and middle-aged baby boomers are still the big part of the demographic. And if you can't reach that demographic, that's a big audience. If you can't reach them, that means that you're failing in your art form. And that's whether you're a movie maker, a choreographer, a novelist, or a jazz musician, yeah. you know. Well, I think when you listen to commercials now that have uh, jazz behind them, the, the people behind those commercials are recognizing who the buying power, where the buying power is. Yeah. And they still think commercials are still aimed at 20-year-olds, I think. The Gap commercials, you know, where they're singing kind of a jazzy kind of melody and they pass it around amongst a bunch of uh, young models yeah. comes to mind. Or the, I don't know what it is, I've seen commercials recently in, set in bars. There are a lot of commercials set in bars. Mm -hmm. And there's like some play back and forth between the guy and the girl at the bar. And it's not always about liquor. Mm -hmm. It could be about something else. And I, I mean, there's a lot of youth culture in our society. And I think that that's kind of left over from the baby boomers too, because we were the big demographic in 68, and if they can only get us to buy the new product. But now they're not trying to get us to buy the product that we can really use as, as 50 year olds. You know, mm -hmm. I guess they figure we know what we need as fifty-year-olds. Yeah, <laughs> and they also think that our tastes have, cha have solidified. There's the idea that when you're in middle age, you know what you like, and it's not going to change anymore. You're not mm -hmm. going to grow in your aesthetic ch choices. That what you liked when you were twenty is what you're still going to like or twenty-five. I'm not sure that's true. I don't know that it has to be true. Yeah. Um, I was looking at a statement you had about. Someone asked you about free jazz, and I, I liked what you said, and I wonder if you could just expand a little. You said, free to know a lot, free to be willing to investigate all possibilities. I think that's what free jazz is about. I thought that was a really interesting statement Thank because you. some people, including myself, if you said free jazz to me, I would think of Ascension and Ornette Coleman's free jazz and records that are fairly hard to listen to. Hmm. At least for me, they were at the mm -hmm. time. But you have any thoughts about what free jazz means these days? Mm. 
Well, I think I think that the idea that jazz can be anything is a, is an idea that has been widely accepted in the jazz community. Free jazz can be based on, or not, not free jazz. Let me say, jazz can be based on Balkan rhythms. Jazz can be inclusive of uh, Chinese instruments. Jazz can be uh, electronica. Uh, the idea that jazz is not just you know a three chord uh, improvisation over swing rhythm, I think that idea has been widely accepted. And I think that when Ornette Coleman did the free jazz album, you know, was it 62 or 63, uh, that's what he was breaking out of. The, the jazz is just mm -hmm. based on improvisation on standards. And I think now today we say jazz can, you know, if you call it jazz, maybe it is. Or I say to my students, uh, if it's contemporary music, instrumental, played in America, I'm going to call it jazz unless you can prove to me that it's not. How can you prove to me that it's not jazz? What doesn't it have in it that comes from jazz? Or, you know, what is the basis of it that's, that's not that? How can you improvise in America on any basis other than the jazz basis? We have been so steeped in that for a hundred mm -hmm. years. Um, I mean, bluegrass, I think bluegrass has some connection to jazz. Um, electronica, anything interesting that's happening in it comes out of jazz. Um, I think that the, what you're referring to, Monk, the, uh, the difficult music to listen to, uh, what makes it difficult is that it provides the listener with an unfamiliar soundscape that the listener has to apply himself to or herself to in order to make sense of. Mm -hmm. And not all of those soundscapes are immediately sensuous or, or embracing. I still find Ascension pretty difficult to listen to. It's a big, uh, beautifully ugly piece of music, mm -hmm. you know. It, it's a raw, powerful wash of music. And uh, most recently they uh, released Coltrane's last live performance at the Olatunji Center. And that also is very, it's not a beautiful, cla classically beautiful saxophone sound. The guy is raging with an inc incredible amount of passion. But to get close to that passion, to pull something out of it, I, I found it a valuable listening experience that way. Um, Free Jazz, the Ornette Coleman album, is only difficult because there's a lot of things going on at one time. And if you follow any one of those musicians through the piece, it's not difficult, you know, and Dolphy plays delightful stuff throughout the entire piece, Ornette too, and Freddie Hubbard too, and Don Cherry too. It's just that they're all happening at once. Yeah. So, you know, can you make your mind large enough that you can kind of like be in that playground? But there's a lot going on. That's, to me, that was never ugly. I mean, it was sort of, you know. Well, Dixieland did the same right, thing. Right, exactly. You know? It's, it's uh, yeah, collaborative, you know. Right, spontaneous um, improvisation. Plus, those guys were experimenting. You know, they were. It, they they were, were taking chances. Right. So, I I s oftentimes wonder if if Coltrane um, thought that Ascension was a successful record. Maybe I I have not read whether or not his own opinion on it. Well, I think that Coltrane was going for some. I don't think he ever made. I I don't know. I don't know. I, it, it strikes me that he had a uh, ideal in mind that no realization was ever going to uh, reach, mm. was ever going to attain. I think Coltrane had some very high standards, and you know, the, the, the marvelous thing about Coltrane is that he, he tried to try. He went for them, and but just by going for them, however short he falls of actually having us ascend, you know, to uh, he, he gives us a platform so we can begin to see what ascension might really be. Mm -hmm. He gives us some sort of lift and launch. Um, there's, it's not all experimentation on those records either. I mean, Free Jazz, you know, they released a 20-minute version that Ornette did as a first take. And it has all of the structural guideposts that are actually in the record. Ornette knows very well what he does before he does it. I mean, I've mm -hmm. sat in on Ornette's sessions. Ornette is a meticulous planner. You know, and it, 
you can hear it even in the prime time stuff when it sounds like the sound is so large. There's so many different things happening, but they end on a you know on a <laughs> downbeat. You go, How did they do that? Well, Ornette knows exactly what's happening. There's no uh, there's plenty of spontaneity, but there's no um, and there's surprises. But it, mm -hmm. it's not a f free of it's not just like a slice of okay now we're going to blow and see what happens. Uh -huh. The art ensemble also. Uh, meticulously arranged and very very smartly segued from episode to episode and there was space to improvise within the episodes but they had a lot of turning points a lot of structural p things in place I don't know who really does free jazz without any plan uh -huh. I think that that's an idea that uh, that we can just get up and blow is something that amateurs um, you know believe and some of those amateurs have have tried to turn their work into careers and I think they fall short because unless you have a uh, a sense of where you're going, um, you're not going to be able to deliver. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like taking a pizza out. Well, I'm going to deliver it, and I don't know where I'm going to go. Well, you're not. <laughs> you know, if you're a pizza <laughs> delivery guy, of uh, I'm doing free delivery, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and no one's going to enjoy it either. <laughs> That's right. <you> know. <laughs> this could be a a question you might need to think about, but. If you could be a fly on the wall and go back in history, are there any like moments oh, that I you wish know. you could have witnessed? Oh, I would have liked to have heard uh, Jelly Roll live. You know, mm -hmm. that would be great. I, I, I found that, you know, when I started listening, I was listening to only the avant-garde, you know, or what was considered the avant-garde then. And now, um, there's some traditional jazz or you know the early classics that I still don't feel like I understand and know how they're. I mean, I, they give me a lot of joy to listen to uh, Jelly Roll or the Hot Fives, and uh, that's just as big a mystery to me as the Art Ensemble was when I first started listening to the Art Ensemble. So I would really like to have heard those. Uh, Red Allen is somebody I would have loved to have heard live mm -hmm. during the 30s. Um, I would have liked to have uh, been on the uh, recording session where uh, Coleman Hawkins, Red Allen, and uh, Wayman Carver did the first flute solo on Sweet Sue. Oh, sure. That would have been fun for me. Um, oh, what else? Uh, I, I try and, you know, I, I'm more curious about what's going to happen, mm -hmm. basically, than what's already happened. Yeah. Um, I would have liked to have heard Charlie Parker live. That would have been great. Uh, I think I heard Charlie Parker when I was about two or three on the radio. I think that that was really like my first early memory of hearing a mm -hmm. saxophone solo. And as much as I can recapture it now, I think it must have been Bird. I can't imagine who else it would have been. Right. Um, I heard Coltrane live. I guess I would like to revisit that because it was way over my head when I heard it. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually Dave Liebman is going to give me a tape of that concert, so I will get a chance to hear it oh, again. Oh, nice. Um, I stood outside the plug nickel when Miles was uh, there with Wayne Shorter, Tony Williams, yeah. Ron Carter, and Herbie, and I would have liked to have been able to go inside. <laughs> I was too young to go you inside. You were too young? Yeah. yeah. But that would, I would have enjoyed that, I think. Uh -huh. um, and Wes Montgomery. Mm -hmm. I wish I had caught the half note with Wynton Kelly. I would have really dug that. Mm. Yeah. I know. Um, my favorite guy is Cannonball, and I don't wonder if you ever saw him live. Uh, no, I just barely missed him. I, he was going to play at University of uh, Illinois, Chicago Circle Campus, mm -hmm. and then I think the concert got canceled. Oh. I don't think I ever saw him live. I like the album he did with uh, Bill Evans. Yeah. Um, know What I Mean, isn't that what yeah, it is? Yeah, regard... Uh, s it's got Waltz for Dead. Yeah, Know What I Mean, sure. Know What I Mean? Yep. Riverside. Yep. I like that a lot. I like I like Cannibal. I like the very last double album he did. Um, Lover. Yeah. I think no, it was. Well, that's I think that's the one that came out afterward. Yeah. I think there was one before that, and he had played Streets of New York and mm -hmm. very good album. Yeah. Very underrated musician in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And Nat wrote some really oh, great tunes. I guess he did. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the Jazz Journalists Association and. Um, you think that there's a responsibility? Uh, let me rephrase that. Some musicians don't like critics. 
So I've heard. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand why. <laughs> I, is there? Uh, do you think that there's that they have reasons for that that are legitimate? Oh sure. Um, nobody likes to be told that their hands are dirty. You know, if your mother—that's what criticism means. Oh. Your mother is saying, "Go wash your hands again before you come to dinner." Now that's why we're calling it jazz journalists instead of critics. Uh, there's really very little serious criticism yeah. that's done in the name of uh, publication work anyway these days. Um, I think that, like any profession, uh, the jazz journalists are still learning how to do what they do, and they're not all the uh, at the top of their at the top of their metier. I think that uh, there's no training in music journalism, certainly in jazz journalism, and um, or music criticism. So. A lot of us would just kind of stumble around trying to figure out how to do it and how to do it right and how to do it well. So I think that the musicians uh, have a point when they say, well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Not all of us do know what we're talking about. Um, that's not to criticize my colleagues. That's to s give them credit for trying to talk about something which, as I said before, is quite elusive, quite ethereal and insubstantial. And how to put it into words is a difficult thing to figure mm -hmm. out how to do. Now that said, the musicians have their own point of view. We are not necessarily writing for musicians to be musicians. I don't believe that. I think we're writing for other listeners to try to inform and guide those listeners to the kinds of things that, that um, the revelations and the experiences that we've had that we think are worth transmitting. And p positive, insightful, or, or negative insightful criticism serves a real function. Somebody said after Oscar Peterson's uh, diatribe last night, I guess, uh, which I didn't hear, against didn't jazz hear. journalists. Well, th this is what he, he opened up with when he was given his award, that oh. uh, he, as it, was, it became an attack on jazz critics. And, uh, you know, I'm sure Oscar Peterson has had some bad reviews. But I can't say that he's suffered from <laughs> yeah. jazz criticism. Right. And I think that his perspective on what he does, uh, I do not think that musicians share the perspective that jazz critics share on the music. Musicians are focused on what they're doing, and they understand what they're doing internally. They're not necessarily able to articulate it, and we're not looking to them to do that. I think a good jazz journalist who's doing interviews helps the musician to articulate what they're doing for the reader. Um, but we can help them because we're supposed to be good with words the way they're good with music. Mm -hmm. I think that most creative artists are not uh, what we call objective <laughs> about other artists. You know, They're doing what they do because they have a passion for it and they think that that's the thing that needs to be done. And therefore what the other guy is doing is slightly wrong. If the other guy was doing it just the way they were doing it, well, that would be better, except they would be copycats, <laughs> you know. Right. So, I mean, it's interesting when you read jazz journalism or writing by a musician, Rex Stewart in Downbeat, or, uh, oh, uh, was the pianist out of uh, Chicago, the traditional pianist, the, uh, Art Hodes. Mm -hmm. You know, they have very strong points of view, but it's not necessarily a point of view that's going to transfer to the, just the curious listener, you know. It's like talking to somebody who's already got a hand in the game and they have an agenda. So that, that sort of takes it out of the realm of journalism to me. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't make it criticism that I could necessarily trust, although if the, uh, the musician could be quite uh, enlightening about what his colleagues are doing, whether he likes it or not, but then I have to decide whether it's worth doing yeah. as a listener for myself. Do you find it um, difficult sometimes to, let's say, rein in your own opinions about whether songs, particular songs from artists, have a meaning beyond the music? And, and what I mean by that, I, I heard this anecdote about uh, a critic who had written about Albert, Albert Eiler. And was imposing his own uh, feelings about the music that that Albert was playing about 
oppression and you know his passion and the whole thing and that that Albert read that and said that's not what I was thinking at all I was just playing so to shorten the question do you ever have a circumstance where you have to say to yourself maybe this isn't what this person was about at all I, I've had that circumstance but I don't necessarily try to rein it in I just try to clue in the reader that maybe this is coming from me me mm -hmm. you know I think that whatever the art suggests to the perceiver of the art is valid. You know, at least to that perceiver, it's valid. And then uh -huh. we can debate about what you know, what. But okay. it, the interpretation is one of the things that critics or journalists, uh, particularly critics, are supposed to be about: interpreting the art. It's not just describing it. If we were going to describe it, then we should all have the degrees in uh, music theory, so that we can work in music notation. And you know, the downbeat reviews then would be filled with music notation and then he does you know this you know I th it's interpretation and, and and making the 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 jump from what this sounds like to me what this might mean to you what okay. this might mean to our society what it means in the context what it means to the guy who, who created it what the intention is but what the interpretations can be and what the ramifications can be that makes interesting reading to me mm -hmm. well a good listener and reader I think could could profit from finding a critic or journalist that seems to be on the same wavelength as them. And mm, if they like particular records, that it's going to be a good chance that I'm going to enjoy that too. I think the consumer guide aspect of jazz journalism is, is valuable if it functions in that way. I like to be a little bit ahead of my uh, readers. Uh -huh. I hope I can suggest things to them that they haven't thought of before. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to be, you know, uh, not always provocative, uh, but or inspiring. But you know, I want to be more insightful. I, I have a lot of experience listening. That's what I try to do seriously for, for a living. So I hope I can bring something to them they haven't thought of before. I want to be on the same wavelength with them. I, I don't want to hold myself above my reader, and I don't want to hold myself above the the musician, who's the creator whose work I'm considering. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be a mediator somehow between them, and I think that that means that I need to communicate with the musician, either by listening or by actually talking to, to them. And I need to communicate to my reader by writing clearly and vividly in a way that they enjoy reading, that they're going to keep reading to get to the end, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a writer's job. Yeah. So this is something that we try to kind of talk about in the Jazz Journalists Association to some extent. We're doing um, clinics uh, today, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, with young uh, aspiring jazz journalists. And we hope to impart some of the basics of, uh, of what we're doing to them. Uh, do a little mentoring or uh, guidance of people who are writing. Talk to them about the realities of working in jazz journalism. Uh, offering them the benefits of our vast experience. Mm -hmm. um, the networking aspect, we have the Jazz Journalists Association uh, started in 85 at a meeting in Chicago that brought together writers and broadcasters. I think it was sponsored by the NEA. Um, and uh, we decided we should have some sort of organization, mostly just for networking purposes. So if we go to a city that we're not familiar with for a festival, we got somebody to go out to dinner with. Mm -hmm. And it's worked very well that way. Right. Um, and of course, I think that uh, jazz journalists have often been people who did not engage successfully in social functions as teenagers. You know, instead they sat in their rooms listening to their records. Uh -huh. And I think that giving them a safe social forum is a good thing and suggest to them that this is not uh, uh, a sin that they're sitting listening to the records, but a lot of us do it, and it's sort of a normal behavior, and it's it's got a, a valuable place in our society. They don't have to hide it or be ashamed of it, mm -hmm. and that they can actually ask for decent money or working conditions, uh, you know, if they're going to pursue this, that they are professionals, that they can meet some professional standards, and we can talk about what kind of professional uh, standards we'd like to see imposed on our a profession I'd like to be established um, so it's worked in a lot of those ways and also informs the general public and the musician about what it is we do we do that through our website 
Uh, we expose a lot of new music. I mean, the, it's the journalists who discover the talent and bring it to the attention of the record companies often, the uh, booking agents, the uh, guys and producers. If I get enthusiastic about a young band, I let people know about it. Gonzalo Rubicalba, who I've written about quite a lot, I, mean, I heard him in 85 in Berlin when he was doing his electric uh, Cuban uh, sort of fusion thing. And I didn't think so much of it at that time. Then I guess I heard about him through Charlie Hayden, mentioned him to me, and I saw him perform or do a recording here in Toronto when he couldn't come into the U.S. I was a, uh, invited to go to the studio and hear him with uh, Dijonette and Charlie Hayden, and I thought it was great. The Blessing is the album that came out of that. And I started writing about him, and I think he's just a wonderful pianist. And I've, you know, followed his career, and I think he's a substantial pr uh, performer. I've written about him a couple times for Downbeat, and I've written about him for other publications. And I guess I've written his liner notes also. And after a while, it accrues some substance, you know, to support this person. If Howard Mandel likes him in this way, well, you know, maybe there's something there we, we should pay some attention to. Mm -hmm. or Don Pullen, Andrew Hill. Uh, Andrew is very grateful to me, and, and I feel very, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that, you know. Andrew says, you stopped writing about me as somebody, all the, all the articles until you wrote about me, Howard, were about me as a performer in the 60s. You brought me up to date. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I think I've been very lucky to, to run into some musicians I could do that with. Sonny Chris, I wrote about for Downbeat early on. I took uh, Grover Washington seriously. And he was grateful for that. And I think Grover was, he's not Charlie Parker, but he's a decent musician, you know, mm -hmm. and he deserves some respect that way. So I don't know, I think I got a little off yeah, point there, <laughs> but uh, um, there are things that jazz journalists do for the art form. We are the historians. We're writing the history in the moment that it's happening. Mm -hmm. We're not waiting until everybody's dead and then trying to go back and do the research. We're out there on the front lines, seeing the concerts, at the clubs, getting the records, and we're telling you what's happening now. We may not be benefiting from having a historical perspective, but I think that we're benefiting from being there as it's going down. And this is music that takes place in the moment, and I think it deserves to have reportage from the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't report a war six years later, yeah. you report it from the front lines. And this is not a war, this is a cultural creation, and it's exciting to be there while it's being created. And, and you know, and bringing back these nuggets about what happened, how it happened, who did it, what they were thinking. You know, it's the same five, the who, what, where, when, why, and how thing. And we can apply it to the creation of an art. It's very exciting. Good statement. Thank you. And uh, Downbeat's been around for an awful long time. That's a is it healthy? A good future for it? Oh, yes. now you're going to get Sorry. me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually Downbeat has made some changes recently that I'm not really at liberty to talk about, but I think they uh, are, are about to announce a change in the uh, publisher that I think will be good for it. Uh -huh. Downbeat is in some ways frustrating. Frustrating. And Downbeat could have been Rolling Stone. You know, Downbeat was the music magazine before there were music magazines yeah. in this country. Downbeat could have been Spin. It it, it has to do with the uh, dare I say uh, uh, narrow ambitions mm -hmm. of the publication that it did think. not grow in that way and thrive yeah. in that way. Now it's given birth to Jazz Times and Jazz Is. Right. You no. Know, but it, uh, I don't think it served the music in the way that it might have. Okay. I, w I wish it will. I hope it will sometime. Yeah. And it's not the only publication. I mean, I've worked with for them since 74, but I have written for Jazz Times and Jazz Is. Right. And uh, really anybody who would pay me. Swing Journal, The Wire, Rit Me, which is a Finnish jazz magazine, Bravo from Brazil, uh, Italian jazz magazines, Swiss magazines, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of journalism and, and publication about the music, but it's very scattered and seldom in one place. We're seeing a lot of great jazz writing in book form now, 
And that's very unusual. Yeah. And that was not happening 20 years ago. It's very difficult. I don't think that the publishers are making a lot of money on most of the jazz biographies and uh, collections, histories that are coming out. But they seem to be willing to take a chance on it. And I think that's a good thing. Great. Well, I know you have to get going, and I appreciate your conversation today. And My pleasure. Keep doing what you're doing. Oh, like I have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks so much. Thank you.